Welcome to episode 45 of the 24 Hour Hustle Show. And today we got special guest, CEO of Life of a Bombshell Cosmetics, Kashira Moffat. Welcome to the 24 Hour Hustle Show. I'm your host, Anthony Freeze, and this is the show where we get the opportunity to sit down with amazing, accomplished guests and find out all about their stories, their struggles, and also their success and kill the excuse of time. Um, if this is the very first time you're finding out about us, definitely make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the bell so you can get notifications every single time we post. But today, I am super excited that we got Kashira on here today. I have been following your stuff literally on social media <laughs> a couple years now. So this has been a, a definitely something to make it for some time now. So yeah. I've definitely admired the work that you're doing. Um, you're doing awesome things. And I'm glad that we are able to connect today and be able to share with the audience. So welcome Thank to you. the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. So for people who don't know who you are yet, which I would be surprised, <laughs> um, we've already had a couple people on the show that already know what you do and everything but for those who don't know uh you know give us your name your background some of the things that you are doing awesome well my name is Kashira Moffat and I call myself the chief bombshell officer of the KSM group and under the KSM group I have two core businesses the first is my branding business under the power collective where I coach women entrepreneurs on monetizing their expertise branding their brilliance and monetizing their online presence um, I do that through coaching, through books, classes, all kinds of great stuff. And then under that business as well, I have my makeup line, Life of a Bombshell Cosmetics, which launched April 2017. It's still a relatively new business. Um, started as a passion project, which I'm sure we'll explore. Um, so those are the things that I have going on in a nutshell, mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a shorter version, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. And we're definitely going to get into a lot of those different things. I feel like we can, we're can. we definitely going to unpack mm -hmm. a lot of different things that will help a lot of people that watch this episode for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but before we actually get to that, you know, so that we can get a little bit more of an understanding of who you are as a person, what, you know, what was some of your child life like uh, growing up? What were some of the things that inspired you, motivated you? What were maybe some of the things that developed your mindset? Just kind of take us yeah. through your story of what so brought you here. I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. I am a shy town girl. I was born to a single mommy. I was an only child. And my mom definitely instilled in me the value of, of education and excellence. My mom was a stickler for grades in a really good way, really encouraged me. If I was struggling with something, she would stay up all night and help me, whether it was math or whatever else. And so she really instilled in me that, you know, it's okay to, like, struggle with things, but you have to keep going and to never give up, you know, and that definitely stuck with me as I started to think about career stuff you know in high school when we we're all trying to figure out what we want to do and I went through so many different phases of what I wanted to do with my life um, my initial career profession was actually being a doctor so that's what I thought I wanted to do for the longest and I did like all of these programs and it just did not work out <laughs> and I was like okay I have to find something else and I actually interned when I was growing up in Chicago at a private equity firm at age 16 had no idea what private equity even meant, right? Mm -hmm. There was this program called the Chicago Summer Business Institute. And if you had, like, a certain GPA, you could apply for the program. And they were meant to give high school kids co uh, business world experiences. And I interviewed because I wanted to work at the hospital. They mm -hmm. had a hospital administration job with, like, Northwestern. And I'm like, oh, I could do that. Maybe I can't be a doctor, but I could work in the environment. So mm -hmm. I interviewed for that. I interviewed with two guys, one from J.P. Morgan and one from this company called UIB Capital. And they were like... You'd be great at finance. I was like, mm. finance? Who knows what finance is at 16? So right. the guy from UIB hired me in a private equity firm. I'm working across the street from the Sears Tower, which I think everybody kind of knows that, that mega building. I had an office. I'm looking at business plans. This is my first exposure to entrepreneurship at 16, and that propelled me to want to go to business school. Their chief marketing officer was my mentor. She told me the value of an MBA, and from there, I went to Hampton University and HBCU when I studied business, and they had a five-year MBA program. So I was there for five years, and I got both of my degrees. I did internships every summer in different industries and propelled here to Pittsburgh, and I landed at PNC, 
which is where I started in human resources. So they had an HR leadership development program. And so in 12 months, I worked in every area of HR. And when I came out of that, I was in training as well as recruitment, kind of on like in a hybrid role. And li literally where the business in me came from, I was side hustling that whole time unofficially. I was writing resumes and doing career coaching and doing LinkedIn profiles because people kept calling me. I wasn't actually marketing myself. And that is how I went from someone that was in business and in corporate to thinking about entrepreneurship at all. Mm -hmm. That is an awesome story. What would you say for you was it what got you into entrepreneurship? What you know, what made you want to take that, you know, that leap of faith and get into it? Yeah, and it, it was just honestly something that I did for fun and for passion. I, I worked at my college career center at Hampton. I actually did it for extra money, mm -hmm. but it just taught me a lot, gave me a lot of exposure. But when I was doing these resumes and, you know, making fifty dollars here, hundred dollars there, I didn't I wasn't I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I had a business, but mm -hmm. I kept getting calls. I wasn't marketing. I didn't have my website at the time. Mm -hmm. And one of my sorority sisters said, you know, you need to start, you know, actually charging for this and, like, having a real business because somebody's going to take advantage of you one day if you don't. Because there were some people I was still doing it for free out of the kindness of my heart. And then that, that actually happened. Like, someone tried to take advantage of me and get me to do all this work for no money. And mm -hmm. I knew that they didn't even like me. So I was like, okay, this isn't cool. Right. So I decided to build a brand. And I decided to work with one of my other sorority sisters who was in PR to build a website. I didn't know anything about web design at that time. She put the website up, and I loved to write. So I was writing blogs and doing all of that stuff, and I realized that these things that I was doing either for free or for little to no money, I was doing it all the time. It didn't matter if I was tired, if it was a weekend. Like, that's how I knew that this is something that I should explore because this is something that I just loved doing. It just gave me life, and it was starting to give me a little bit more life than my nine to five because we both worked in corporate we know that at the end of the day when budgets get cut and things change like all of the things that we're passionate about like diversity and inclusion giving people opportunities that may otherwise not get those like that stuff kind of goes out of the window and in my side business I'm able to do those things and stick to my values and the things that drive me while at the same time bringing in money so it's like why not mm -hmm. it's something that you're passionate about and you also get the control to kind of yeah. determine what you want to do as far as like the future goes and you're doing what you love yeah. so um, those are definitely big key factors I mean passion is definitely a huge thing especially whenever it's something that you want to pursue you know, finding it what that is, you know, being self aware of who you are and the things that you're interested in mm -hmm. and, and seeing if it can happen for you. Yeah. And connecting passion to actual business acumen, right? Because so, there are some passions that are meant to be hobbies or volunteer work. Every passion isn't necessarily meant to be a business. That's something that I don't readily say. However, if you have business acumen, you can recognize when there is a gap or what there's a need that needs to be filled in an industry. And I could tell that I was consistently getting calls and texts from people who I didn't even know. They're like, oh, I got your number from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? And do you know how vulnerable it is to call someone and say, I need a new job or I just got fired and I need help getting placed? Like, that's a vulnerable thing. So mm -hmm. I, that showed me that there's a need for this kind of support for this demographic that I was working with, which were primarily fresh out of college grads who took jobs because they didn't want to move back home with their parents, but they were hating what they were doing, and they didn't feel that they had the skills to readily get another job, they mm -hmm. called an expert. So I was able to tell earlier on that there was a need for this and that it could be a viable business. Now, what that business model would look like, I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. but I at least had evidence, real proof, mm -hmm. and a proof money trail concept. to say this is going to be something that can work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs tend to skip over mm -hmm. doing the research, having a proof of concept, seeing if it actually works. We just tend, yeah. I know even myself sometimes, we get so excited about things, we just kind of just jump right in yeah. and just, you know, feel like we got a business on our hands. Well, sometimes that may not be the case. <laughs> yeah. You know, you definitely got to do your research on it. You definitely got to see if there's a need, yeah. seeing if there's a, a, a gap that you can fill and be able to provide a service for Absolutely. people. So um, those are definitely important indicators for sure. So, so, Doing the helping people with the resumes and things like that, that came first? Yes. Okay. So um, what was the, uh, was that the first initial business or it what was? It was. And, and <clears throat> what, it was it was still the KSM group at the time. I was, I was not branding her movement yet, which I'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. I was the brand that I created. And at this point, I was really young and just didn't know a lot about anything other than traditional business. But I was really like, okay, I need a name because Kashira is hard to pronounce and like, 
people are gonna look at it and be like, what? So I wanna create something cute. So I created this screen name called Two Moves Ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And the premise was, you know, your life, your career, make your move. It was so cute. <laughs> and it was based on the game of chess. In my MBA program, we had to learn how to play chess. Mm -hmm. And our dean felt that if we knew how to play chess, it would help us navigate our careers better because we can start to anticipate the moves of others around us. We can't control their moves, but we can control ours and mm -hmm. try to get them to play into our hands. So that's where the brand came from. So I actually had, at the time, I was smart enough to get recommendations on LinkedIn for my work. Even if I didn't charge them for it, I asked every person to give me a recommendation on LinkedIn. So to this day, I have like 30-something recommendations on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So a woman found my profile. We did have a mutual connection, and she saw the recommendations that I had around my work on LinkedIn. That was like my unique factor, the LinkedIn and building that. So she reached out to me and she said, hey, you don't know me, but I came across your profile. We do have a mutual connection. My son actually went to Hampton, so I know that you're talented. Can we have a conversation about your work? So I'm like, oh, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. So she says, I want to hire you to do LinkedIn for me, but I'm an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years, and I need you to brand this to get me more clients. Can you do it? And I said, no. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. I was like, I don't think so. I've never done that before. I've only branded people to get jobs, but I can try. Yeah. And I told her, I said, how about this? Let me just do it, and I won't charge you. But if you like it, then you yeah. can pay me. And she loves what I did for her. She not only paid me for that, she paid me to write her website content. She paid me to write her biography, set up her social media. Mm -hmm. Then she recommended me to all of her entrepreneur friends. So now I'm hybrid working with entrepreneurs on their content, hybrid working with job seekers. And I started to realize that I loved working with the entrepreneurs. Even though at that time it was an older demographic I was working with, they just seemed so much more fearless and confident and even if they didn't know how to use the tools I was telling them about they weren't I didn't really have to do a lot of convincing they were just like you know what this is my passion this is my livelihood if you say this is going to work I'm going to try it mm -hmm. whereas with some job seekers I would spend like hours trying to convince them of their own talent right <laughs> based yeah. on their resume they would argue like oh that's not good enough to be on a resume yes it so yeah. I just was like I, I'm not a life coach and I'm not a therapist like I just yeah I want to do the strategy part so I was doing the I was doing both businesses up until it's 2018 and up until January of 2017 mm -hmm. I didn't want to let it go because resumes were my primary source of revenue and the entrepreneurship stuff was still new I wasn't heavily marketing it and I wanted to learn more so I started to just in, indulge myself in books um, videos podcasts just soaking up information as much as I can and at the same time building my own brand so two moves ahead transition into her movement because I wanted to figure out how can I create this community for these women that are doing these amazing things in corporate and in entrepreneurship where they could be safe to be themselves. They're multifaceted selves where women who are serious about their business aren't necessarily business 24-7. You mm -hmm. know, we are sisters, we're mothers, we're wives, we're daughters, so we have other components to us. Right. So I built a Facebook group called the Her Movement Network. And now, present day, there's 2,600 members from 10 countries in this group. But it started off as a blog where I would write about career, entrepreneurship, lifestyle, time management, all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, that those blogs are starting to be a driver for my services. But at, at, at that point, in January 2017, I just made the decision. And we all who are in entrepreneurship have had that experience where you have to step out on faith and make a decision. It's like, okay, it's scary to cut off the key thing that's bringing in your revenue. Mm -hmm. But if you want to open up the doors for that next level of abundance you desire, you have to make room for it. You have to let certain things go, and I did. And so now, present day, I solely work with entrepreneurs. That is awesome. It's amazing to hear how everything is kind of evolved with everything yeah. and how, you know, the branding actually started. Someone actually said, hey, could you, you know, brand my whole thing yeah. with my LinkedIn? Oh, I can't. I, I don't know if I could do it, but you did it anyway. It turned yeah. out to be good. Now you <laughs> became like a, brand, <laughs> a, a great brand strategist. Now yeah. you're like killing it, working with a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. That is a very inspiring story Thank for you. sure. Um, and, I, and, I, and I love that you shared that. So, you know, what would you say, like, whenever you did get all of this started, like, take us in the mindset of, what was like the initial challenges besides you know not you know having the experience what were some of the other initial challenges that mm -hmm. you faced uh in the beginning of getting these things started including maybe the cosmetics as well because we're gonna yeah, you know continue to move forward with that. that um and how did you overcome some of those challenges so initially when i was announced i'll talk about the challenge of making the pivot right because we were having that conversation around like you know jumping into things not realizing if it's viable what kind of doing that so 
I realized when I started two moves ahead that I jumped into that. And though there was proof of like a business, I didn't really take the time to define my brand. I didn't take the time to say this is who I am, this is what I do. Because let's be honest, when that site launched, it was multifaceted. It was meant to be, oh, here's my services, here's my blog, and then I had my resume. Like, oh, if you want to hire me <laughs> to mm. come work with your company, like, feel free. Right. So it was, sending, it was sending so many messages. So I, when I did the Her Movement pivot, you know, the biggest challenge was, like, what do I want to be known for at this point? What impact do I want to have? Who do I want to serve? As someone who loves helping people in general, um, I had to kind of narrow that down. And people get really afraid of finding a niche and finding a target audience. And they feel like they're going to miss out on money or miss out on opportunity if they actually have a, a defined platform. But to the contrary, if you market to too many people, you run the risk of making no money because your message is too broad and nobody resonates with it. Mm -hmm. So some of, some of the earlier challenges really evolved around defining that proposition statement around here's the value I can add to your life and to your business. Um, and so I overcame that by giving myself some grace to actually think through it and not rush and not feel like I need to propel and launch today. Like I gave myself some time to really define that and do all of the things that I teach my clients now around creating your SWOT analysis, around defining the things that make you unique and valuable. Um, additional challenges also included, okay, now that this has happened, you know, how do I best want to market myself? Because there's a thousand and one ways to market something. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do things that were still authentic and true to me while at the same time stretching me. So that included actually getting on video. So up until then, I was terrified. Like, if I would have met you then, you like, oh, come be on the show, I'd have been like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting in front of nobody's camera. I was terrified. I've always been a good public speaker because I had to be in business school. They made us do impromptu speeches every year for five years every mm. day for five years you know so I was good at that but when it came to sitting in front of a camera it terrorized terrified me but in my line of work camp video helps it translates so much better oh, than yeah. anything else and I was writing these great blog posts but people still had so many questions mm -hmm. so I started that was that was when Periscope and live started to become popular and so my way of forcing myself to overcome that was I created a 30 days of branding video challenge where each day I would do a video on YouTube where I would give you a new branding tip and I made a calendar of all the tasks that you had to do that went along with that tip. And day one was actually a webinar. My first ever webinar, my first ever live video. Mm -hmm. Child, it was a hot mess for the first 15 minutes. I had all the technical difficulties in the world. Man, this is the first episode with this. It wasn't the greatest, but we it got it done. Like everything that could have went wrong when that first 15 minutes did go wrong. But after that, people, people, thank God people like were patient with me. After that, it was great because the content was there. So people were able to, people were comfortable staying with me because they knew that I was about to drop some gems. They right. knew the quality was coming. But honestly, by day 15, a lot of the jitters I had around getting in front of a camera and posting things were gone. Uh -huh. And now, two years later, it's, I can jump on a live stream with ease with no notes. I'm sure you can too. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times you overcome those challenges by just doing trial by fire and putting yourself out there, um, not being in information paralysis where you're just so stuck with research, research, research that you don't actually execute right and execution is the best teacher right mm -hmm. so um and then so going forward i launched life of a bombshell in 2017 um it was meant to be a passion project a little side thing i wanted to sell a little bit of lipstick you know i kind of right. just leave it at that i love to make up i wanted a product-based business as well i wanted another place to test my ideas and my theories and initial challenges with the product-based business is one you need a viable you need a, a quality product so if you're not making things by hand you are now trusting someone else to create something. Even if you are, let's say you're making t-shirts and you have the printer at home and you print them, but you still need to get the shirts from someone else. You're not sitting at home sewing those shirts. Right. You still need to make sure that that vendor has quality shirts that aren't itchy, that aren't going to stretch you know, or shrink or whatever else, right? So it's all about sourcing good quality vendors and manufacturers for your product. And that's where I spent the bulk of my time and had a lot of challenges because there would be vendors who had a range of lipstick colors and beautiful shades, great bottles, but the product smelled awful, mm. right? Or someone who had a great product line, but it wasn't black girl friendly, you know, where I needed this to be black girl friendly because, right. like, hello, yeah. right? <laughs> right. So it was like, you know, but the, so and, that, and that, it was a challenge because it requires patience, right? 
patience and funding, which thankfully I've had the money for it, I saved for it, but some people aren't patient enough to actually try test things out and do the quality control and make sure that they, that things are the way they need to be and then too at the same time taking the time to define what life of a bombshell is. This is not just her movement with lipstick. This is its own new business that needs to stand on its own two feet that has its own variances from what I've already built. So again, the challenge is that the way that I overcame that challenge was being patient and seeing it through and through and putting myself in the customer's shoes. It doesn't matter if you're giving me $2 or $2,000. I want you to be happy with whatever it is you're getting from me and if I'm a customer I would want this product to do certain things or to be a certain way and so I stayed true to that with the makeup mm -hmm. awesome uh, one of the things that you talked about in that story was your 30-day challenge of forcing yourself being in front of the camera because I'm a huge believer obviously uh, video being the way to go for sure because you can do so many things with video I mean you got the video portion you can rip the audio out of it you can transcribe it I mean that's like the base mm -hmm. of content in my thought process if you want to be able to, you know, take these different routes. Um, and be, being able to do that 30-day challenge, um, one of the things that I want to ask is, what do you feel like is more important, the speed of putting out the content and the, the consistency or the actual quality of how it looks or the lighting and things yeah. like that? Which do you feel like should be more important? It's hard, and it's so debatable, right? Because with live stream, I, I do think the fact that live stream has gotten so popular is taken away <coughs> some of the need for a lot of production. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because it's a little bit more relatable to certain audiences. So it depends on your audience, right? Because mm -hmm. some of us have audiences that, that want the production. Others are like, I want to relate to you as a human being. And even though you're still giving me great information, I want to feel and see and like be able to ask you things real time so it just very much depends on your audience but at that point I was still new to the business branding game so I needed to produce content at a more rapid pace to build a solid brand so when you're brand spanking new you don't have the luxury of just putting out one blog a month one video a month mm -hmm. right you need, if you're trying to build a solid ground and say hey I'm here and this is what I do mm -hmm. you need to be out here producing content now that mm -hmm. doesn't mean every day but you need some kind of schedule whereas these days I've been doing this for three years. Mm -hmm. So I can put out one blog a month and my audience is excited. <laughs> yes, here <laughs> right. it is. We out here, right? You know, me missing a week in my podcast today isn't going to kill me. But mm -hmm. when I'm trying to build an audience earlier on, like, you need to be on it with those things. And I know we'll talk about scheduling and all of that stuff mm -hmm. later, but nowadays, even with my live streams, I am now on the other side where I am focusing on the quality of the production. Because my content is going to be dope regardless. Like, right. That's just not going to change. Right. But... You know, I still, th I was trying to figure out how do I make the best of both worlds. Because my audience does prefer a live video. They are not about the pre-recorded stuff unless it's like a course. Mm -hmm. So how can I have a live video that still has great production? Well, there's amazing softwares for that. There's softwares with screen share, softwares where you can have guests, softwares where I can just be in front of my computer and I could put, you know, my name, my logo, and calls to action right on the screen. Mm -hmm. So I've invested, because those things aren't free, I've invested in those tools to do both. I have a ring light that I have in front of my computer when I'm sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. So that I have the quality lighting. I make sure that my office is pretty and neat behind me for aesthetic, right? So I'm still doing the same things that I would be doing if I was making YouTube, except it's live and I can answer questions and engage and what does that do that not only builds my brand as an expert because I can answer things on the fly, mm -hmm. but it also helps my audience feel like they're talking directly to me, which creates trust, it creates relationship. That's awesome. Um, and, and, and also to your point, I mean, you, you've definitely mastered your consistency. I mean, when we sat down and you told me how much you're actually able to produce and be able to, mm -hmm. you know, crank out, it was just mind blowing to mm -hmm. me to figure out and well, find out that you were actually able to do all this from doing the podcast, mm -hmm. the blogging, putting stuff out all the time out mm -hmm. on your Instagram, your Facebook. Um, then you, uh, and then as soon as IGTV came out, um, I know we were one of the first ones. As soon as it came out, boom, we on there. And and it was funny, like you were already doing the training on it, mm -hmm. so I was like, she's killing it. So mm -hmm. you know, f being able to do all those different things and also you know doing other things on the side, how have you been able to maximize on your twenty four hours? Being able to pu push out all this content, what's kind of like your mindset on this? Because I see a lot of social accounts and. 
they they're trying to put stuff out for their business like once a month, once a month here and there. It's like they post something on the seventeenth of August. The post before that was like July seventh. I'm like, what is happening here? Yeah, so yeah. how have you been able to crank out all this content? How are you maximizing all your time? Yeah, that's so good. And I just think you know when people are kind of halfway doing their content, you have to think about it from a customer standpoint. If they can't trust you to show up online consistently how are they going to trust you when they hire you one on one right that's exactly. just not going to happen so the first step is to figure out what platforms make sense for you so while i'm all over the place each of my platforms are different purposes. They're not all meant to sell the same thing or do the same thing. So you may find that you have an audience that is mostly on YouTube and Instagram, so those are the two that you're going to worry about the most. There is no need for you to trust about Facebook and Twitter if that's where your audience hangs out. Mm -hmm. So how do you find out what platforms you should be on? Know who your audience is. Spend the time researching them, right? If you say my audience is... Um, millennial african-american men between the ages of 25 and 32 you can put that in google or other search engines and see okay where are they what networks are they using where are they shopping what are they watching there's already nielsen collects this data anyway mm -hmm. so it's easy to find that kind of stuff and then you can drill down from there so once you figure out what platforms you're using then you can figure out what kind of content makes the most sense for those platforms because Things that I post on Facebook don't get posted on Instagram. Why? It just won't translate. Mm -hmm. The long paragraph statuses will not work in an Instagram <clears throat> caption. It's just not the same deal. So when I'm creating content, I'm really thinking about what makes sense for the platform. So earlier on, my main places were Facebook, um, Twitter, and then Twitter and my blog. I wasn't really hip to Instagram when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And so how I did that is I would, cre I would do this once a year, but I would create a vault of content. I would sit down and I would use this index card method that I teach my clients where I would brainstorm just general topics first. What could I talk about on my blog? So let's go back to career development. It could be the job search, the resume, the cover letter, LinkedIn, right? So I would write them on the blank side of an index card. And then for each card, I would set a timer, like 15, 30 seconds, whatever. And on the line side, I'd write as many blog titles as I could think of in 30 seconds based on that. So, for example, with the job search, it could be um, how to best navigate Indeed, how to um, read a job application, how to apply for a job application, how to find contacts in the company, how to get a referral. You know, like just random things. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of them obviously wouldn't get written about. But when I'm done with that, I would probably have at least, like, per topic, at least 15 to 20 ideas for each topic and I was blogging weekly mm -hmm. so that was way more content than I actually needed so then what can I do with extra content mm -hmm. you know ideas for Facebook statuses ideas for quick videos ideas for whatever else right so I still do that tactic to this day I have a spreadsheet in Google <coughs> Drive so I take all of that put it in the spreadsheet that has ideas for podcasts that aren't out yet ideas for blogs ideas for videos you know some things translate over so thinking about how can you repurpose content right so mm -hmm. all of that stuff is in a spreadsheet so I I what I why I do that is so that I take the burden off my back to come up with ideas. It is very hard to be creative and execute at the same time. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's absolutely. just it's just very stressful on your yeah, body. Yeah. So <laughs> if you take the if you make it easy for yourself, where you say I know this is what I'm creating this week, all you have to do is create. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's how I would do that. I would do everything like that. I would actually try to write content at least a month out. So I would write all my emails, all my blogs, all my posts like a month out so that I could just automate. And I would spend the rest of the time engaging. So I will use automation tools. And there's just so many at this point. Like what I personally use doesn't really matter to anybody. But I would just say they're just go with what's in your budget because the tool that I use now is like kind of expensive. But it makes sense for where I am in business. But all of my posting is automated now, even mm -hmm. Instagram. So now when I'm actually online, I can just engage. I can comment back. I can follow people. I can do certain things and just not worry about posting as much. Even my emails. My emails are automated. My blog's automated. Like, mm -hmm. podcast. Everything is like, once it's done, it's done. Right. So that's how I've gotten away with having so much content on so many different platforms and still being able to be consistent. Mm -hmm. I, you have a good system in place. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have a system in place. They're just kind of doing things manually you know, in real time, which, you know, realistically is not It'll possible catch up to with you. It'll yeah. catch up with you because you're doing things in real time when you feel like it, mm -hmm. and you will not always feel like it. Right. There will always be something, life will always happen to you, and that's just not how business works. Mm -hmm. You know, like PNC and ATMs can't work one day because the CEO was at home sick and don't feel like showing up to work. But they need, there needs to be something in place where if I can't be there, you know, like literally, and I, it's funny how some of my more profitable months have been the months I've done the least work. 
like That's interesting. in terms of producing because the things that were coming out were already done. The sales funnels were already built. Mm -hmm. So while I may have been a little behind creating the next month's content, it didn't create stress on me because I knew that there was things coming out. Mm -hmm. So I could literally be at home with the flu for four days and look at Stripe <laughs> like, oh, I just made $700. <laughs> right. at that. You know, but that's not just because. It's because there's things in place for me to do that, right? So then, you know, even if it's even if you have no idea what these funnels and all this stuff is, at minimum, do you have a website that is functional, up and running, where everything works, mm -hmm. right? People will have that stuff up and the buttons don't work, the checkout don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have a way to get paid? Mm -hmm. Do you have a payment processor? Do you have a bank account? Like, do you have those things set up? You know, do you have it where people, if you're selling a digital product, an ebook, are they getting their stuff automatically? If it's shipping, like, are, is there a system where you're shipping things out timely or you have somebody else shipping it for you? Because at, at minimum, you need those things in place to get paid before you can start doing all of this other advanced stuff around creating content. Some of us don't even have that. We want to get Cash App for everything, and I love Cash App, but at the end of the day, that's not a viable business. No. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with all that you said for sure. Um, and then, and like I said, I love the process that you have in place. It, it's definitely a process that I, I believe a lot of people should get in place for their business if they want to be able to really build mm -hmm. this up and be able to, you know, focus on the important things. Um, and like, and also like uh, what you said, spending the time with engaging with the community. I mean, because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's social media. What people forget about is the social part. You got to be social and engage with your audience and, you know, communicate with with them and reply to different comments or maybe even send them messages and things like that. You got to be able to engage with them. So that's definitely an important part. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that you also talked about was knowing the platform that you have as far as like you would post something on maybe Facebook that you wouldn't share on Instagram. You got to know the different platforms. And the way I kind of look at it, it's almost like different TV channels. Like you wouldn't see something, you know, you would watch some, some central on maybe CNN, but you wouldn't see it on like NBA yeah. or uh, like a, yeah. a sports channel. Yeah. Or like ESPN about, or something. You think about why that platform is created, right? Instagram is a photo sharing platform, mm -hmm. which means the photo matters more than anything else. If the photo mm -hmm. isn't something that's going to grab attention, then people aren't even going to read the caption, right? right? Which is why typically photos that have words and all of that stuff in it, unless it's like a funny meme, it doesn't really convert as well because people are looking for quality imagery. Mm -hmm. If they have quality imagery, then they're more likely to read the caption, but then think about how can I be as concise as possible with Instagram stories? It's meant to be short, quick videos, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about the fact that video and pictorial content there is going to convert higher than anything else. And Instagram is about the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So if you are a consultant, let's say you are a beauty consultant, right? You help people with their with their looks, their wardrobe, etc. Like you need to create that lifestyle on your page. I'm not hiring you if your own closet's not, you know, right. lit or your clothes aren't nice. But thinking about selling that lifestyle of the experience that you're creating. Right, Facebook is literally meant to be something where you're connecting with people. So it's about those statuses, those more personal things, the groups, the engaging on threads. So if you're just up there dropping links and not actually engaging people, you wonder why things aren't working for you. Twitter, microblog, mm -hmm. short to the point statuses is what's going to get you to the next level. And then YouTube, quality video content. Right, this is not the place for your re uh, repurposed live streams. Right? right, so you know you need to really sit down in front of a camera and have good lights. But it's and people may get upset upset about that. But it's not me just saying. It's actually the truth. Mm -hmm. Why were these platforms created? What are they for? Mm -hmm. Right? So you have to think through that if Facebook was created for literal conversations and Instagram was created to share moments and pictures and time, you can't switch that up. Like, that's mm -hmm. just the purpose of platforms. Right. Exactly. You got to use the platforms like they were purposed for. Yeah. So that's definitely a good point. Um, one of the things I definitely want to get into is definitely the sales now because one, mm -hmm. that's a definitely important mm -hmm. thing that yeah. people don't, you know, necessarily like to go <laughs> and talk about. But it's, I mean, if you're going to run a business, I mean, yeah, that is an important factor. now rather than later. Exactly. <laughs> so um, how have you been able to, you know, develop some of the strategies that have been able to help you build up the revenue for your your business I know you use a lot of content marketing and you do mm -hmm. some uh, webinars and things like that so what is kind of like your strategy or thought process on being able to generate your sales right so first it comes down to what am I actually selling so with every from a coach from my coaching business right so I mentioned earlier that I have one-on-one -on -one coaching programs I have books I have 
ebooks, I have courses, right? So when I think, when I'm actually creating what it is I'm selling, I think about who am I creating it for and what's the number one problem it's going to solve. Not a list of problems, not a gang of problems, mm -hmm. that one key problem. Because that's what actually sparks the urge for somebody to buy. They need to feel like you're selling directly to them. You can fix the main thing that's on their head and heart around what they need to do to fix their business, right? So I think about that first. I have to define who is this for because some of my stuff is not for everybody that follows me. Mm -hmm. I have certain niche services that are only for those that have been in business for at least two years. I have certain things that are only for those that are still in the launch phase. So I have to think about how am I communicating to that person? I would speak very differently to somebody that's been in business for two years versus someone that's just getting their idea out, mm -hmm. right? Because they're at different places and they communicate differently. So that's the first step. Who is the pro who is this even for? What problem is it going to solve? You know, building it out from there. And so when I think about the, the channel that I'm going to use to market this, again, where are those people hanging out, right? My more experienced entrepreneurs are the main ones opening my emails, reading my newsletters. My newbies are the main ones tuning into my live streams. So it would make more sense for me to sell my stuff for new entrepreneurs on Facebook Live and sell my experienced entrepreneur packages via email. So, But I've spent a lot of time identifying my audience to know that. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, typically, I create some kind of sales funnel. And a sales funnel is a journey you take a customer on where you're getting them to buy something. And so that journey can look different. That journey can be a series of live streams. It could be a series of emails. It can be a nice mixture of both. But for everything that I have sell, there is some kind of funnel attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, email and video for me are primary drivers of revenue in my business. So it's never just going to be one video introducing a product and you never see me again. Right. It's a series of things. So thinking about... Um, I actually have a, a program called Bombshell Sales Academy where I teach you how to do this. But you have to take the people on a journey from not only ensuring that they are in realization of what their struggle is. People have issues, but they don't know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I'm not making any money. I'm not making any money. I'm posting every day online. Okay, well, your issue isn't necessarily, you know, that you're not making money. It's what you're actually posting online. So I have to now create awareness to an issue. I have to now draw some kind of emotion in, in with this so that you realize that I can feel your pain and I can relate. I have to show my credentials and then introduce this program and tell you why you need it right now and not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's how I drive sales. Like, I follow those steps to a T in all of my vehicles to communicate value <coughs> because, again, I'm selling a service. Now, when it comes to selling lipstick... Like, people don't care. They just want to see what color is it, how long will it last, let me put it on my hand, okay, cool. And then people come up to me at vendor tables, not even speak, just pick up a product, put it on their hand, like, okay, I want it. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier. <laughs> but yeah. when it comes to a service, I have to really show you that you are in need of this and that you're worth it because services are going to be more expensive. So books are pretty easier to sell, too, because people – People like books. People and then people don't really have an issue buying it. When I have, but when you're saying, "Hey, com commit to a four week program. Hey, commit to a three week coaching process." Like I really have to showcase that need. So, building sales funnels, um, sales pages as well. Not every product needs a sales page, but for the most part, everything that I sell from a service standpoint has a sales page. Which is a site, a page, and a website where I'm breaking down not only what the service is and what it entails, but, like, why you need it. Like, you know, you it's, you know I'll, I'll point out how you're probably tired of spending all day on Instagram and not making any money. You're probably tired of being on Facebook and not having anybody engage with you. You know, you re you're ready to be where you see your fave influencers are, but you're not making it. So I have to paint the picture and then show you this, but then also show you, again, why you're worth the investment. You know, here's the transformation that you're going to get when you're done with this service. So for services, it's a little bit more intricate, but ultimately, that's all I drive revenue. I take my time with it. It's not something that you can rush, in my opinion. Like, you have to actually spend time being meticulous with breaking down your strategy and then following it. And then when it's over, looking at the results. Don't just be happy that you made two sales, right? Because mm -hmm. for some of us, that's exciting. Like, okay, I made a sale. Like, right. listen, it's done. Yeah. But going back and looking at the analytics, right? How many people actually watched that live stream? How many clicked on the link that you put in the title of the live stream? How many people actually went to the sales page? How many people actually added this to their cart and didn't check out? You know, kind of looking at it, or if it's email, whatever else, because now you can figure out if 100 people visited my web page and two purchased, then I need to drive 200 to the web page next time to get for the purchase and you may be selling a $5,000 product where you only need two sales to hit your goal go you right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but ain't that the dream but those kind of analytics though are important because now you have goals your goals are now beyond sales your goals are now fully fully around metrics right you have you have goals around how many views you want or how many clicks or how many opens how many web visits because all of that stuff is a formula mm -hmm. and you need to know that we don't like to look at that everybody got Google Analytics but nobody look at it right like, <laughs> like mm -hmm. look at it right mm -hmm. and engage with that because now you're able to 
create your own best practices for your business. There's a lot of information on the internet, a lot of advice, but at the end of the day, you have to figure out what's going to work for me. And you basing it off of just the end game is not enough because you may have had a thousand viewers in a live stream, but nobody clicked on the link. Oh, they probably hated it. No, because those people actually watched the video. They said on the video, maybe the problem was there was no call to action. There was no directive. There was no instructions, right? right. So sometimes we kind of throw away the whole service. Oh, this service is bad. Nobody's going to buy it. Nobody likes it. When the issue was just we didn't tell them to buy it. Right. So having analytics helps you to figure out what those issues are instead of just throwing the whole business away. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those are definitely good tips. And in addition to, you know, the academy and things like that that you have, um, I, there was a great book that I read called Dot Com Secrets. I'm pretty sure you heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, you read it? No, I have not. Uh, it's a great book because everything that you just said and just lined out was exactly like that book to the T. So um, if anybody's looking for any information, that is also a good book, Dot Com Secrets, as a, uh, in addition to your academy and things mm -hmm. like that. Because having the sales funnels in, having that series of events that you're, you're taking the customer on a journey mm -hmm. from the point of contact where they just learn about you to the point of sale. Absolutely. Uh, and it is a journey from start to finish. And there's and those things that are in between, uh, you know, from the content marketing to understanding, you know, did they have a call to action and all those different things that's in between and uh, to get to the point of sale. Mm -hmm. um, those are uh, key things to understand and know about. Um, for sure. So definitely appreciate sharing on that because mm -hmm. that is a very important information. Um, uh, and now as we, you know, get closer to wrapping up, um, what are like some of the big goals that you have that you would say in the future, maybe next two to five years, because you've done a lot. I mean, podcasts, I know, uh, this past year you also had, uh, your seminar, the uh, as well. summit. Uh, the, yeah, the summit, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. We had, um, uh, some people on uh, the show here that that came out to that event. Um, you you know, written uh, your own books and things like that. You've done a lot of great things. Where do you see yourself going in the future? And yeah. maybe let's say the next. And two, it's five so years. funny how hard we are in ourselves, right? Because like we both have done great things. We're just like, eh, no, I got more yeah. work to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to be honest with you, I mean, my my goal is to create to continue to create sustainability with my business to create to continue to create. Um, more systems and processes for myself that allow me to be more away from it so that I can be out doing more. So Hustle Her Way 2019 is coming up. It's my fourth annual summit. Mm -hmm. So obviously I want to be bigger and better than ever. I mean, I definitely have goals of getting national sponsorships, taking Hustle Her Way on the road. Um, I'm starting to do more national speaking engagements, so I definitely want to land more opportunities to do that, more invitations. Um, I do have a goal, but that's about two years off of doing a global retreat. Um, a smaller retreat for women entrepreneurs that I want to take us somewhere, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. lavish where we can get together, fellowship, but also work on our business. So one of my services, I offer a strategic planning day where I fly to my client, I just came back from Chicago doing this, and we spend the full day hashing out their strategy for the next four quarters. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Like, we even go down to building those funnels we just talked about. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, literally do this, do this, do this, right? So it'd be great to just have maybe 10 to 20 women and we're just doing that together. You know, somewhere beautiful with, you know, clear water around yeah. us to having a great time. So I definitely have a goal of bringing that to life. Um, Life of a Bombshell Cosmetics is growing. It's very, growing really fast. You know, we were featured in Essence last year, which is something I'm extremely proud of. Because as a Yucca Black girl, we love our some Essence, so that's like the mecca for me. <laughs> um, but I want to continue to grow that. I definitely have a goal of seeing it being carried in retailers, you know, starting with some smaller boutiques and then growing into something a little bit more larger scale. But I definitely want, you know, this makeup that I created that has the tagline, makeup that matches your hustle, to be in the hands of more women that hustle. Mm -hmm. Well, that is awesome for sure. And then, uh, uh, as we get closer to wrapping up, um, I always the last two questions I always ask is, number one, where is the best place for people to connect with you, uh, engage with some of the things that you're doing, whether they, you know, want to get in, you know, maybe get the book, get in the, the academy, mm -hmm. maybe try out some of the cosmetics, where can they reach you with those yeah. type of things? And then the last question is, what's a 24-hour challenge that you would propose to the audience that they can actually take action on? Because with all the great information that you just shared, one of the things that we don't want to have happen is, you know, Know, they just feel inspired they're motivated it was great information and then they do nothing with it yeah. so you know out of those two things um you know where's the best place for people to contact you and what's the challenge that you so my website for my blog my books my coaching is this is her .com. i'm at kashira all over social media and for my cosmetics it's life of a bombshell .com and at life of a bombshell all over social media and anytime I speak or do a webinar or live stream, I always ask my audience to write down three things that they learned 
and then for each thing that they learn to write down one action that they're going to take based on it. So my 24-hour challenge would be you've gotten a lot of information, <laughs> you've gotten book recommendations, and all kinds of stuff. So write down, you know, the three things that you learned from this episode, and then for each one, one action that you're going to take. And I would challenge you to even say that I'll take in the next 24 hours, right? Because you're going to start to condition yourself to execute, and that is so important. Don't just soak in everything going to all of the events, listen to all of the podcasts, but never actually doing anything. And I know it's scary to put yourself out there, but you will never know if it works until you do it. Absolutely. And those are, and that's a definitely key thing. Um, you know, if you're able to take down notes and, and get the, the things out that you got from the episode, that is definitely, uh, you know, definitely good to have for sure. Yeah, so. In fact, comment them. They're under the video. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what comment we want to have happen, for sure. the three things that you learned because that may inspire someone else that may have missed something. So comment them below. Tag us, mm -hmm. you know, so we can see, put it on Instagram or whatever. Let us Absol know where you hang out. We're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I let us know what, what you're doing. For sure. We'll yeah. engage. Abs absolutely. <laughs> Definitely make sure you comment those for sure because that's the most important part. We wanna I wanna I wanna know, she wants to know like what did you get out of this? Like we don't wanna feel like we just wasted our time here. So <laughs> talking to you for real right now. So um yeah. For sure. Yeah. So uh, I definitely appreciate you coming oh, on course. to the show for sure. I definitely am excited to see all the things that you have going on in the future. Mm -hmm. I definitely would like to get you on in the future again um, just because I, I, I truly believe in what you're doing. I'm proud of the work that Thank you're doing. You. I feel like you definitely are going great places. So, you know, definitely appreciate you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So now that we know what Kashira does with her 24 hours, I want to know what you do with your 24 hours. Definitely make sure you comment down below of at least three things that you got out of this mm -hmm. episode. Make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications, and we will see you on the next episode.